So Apple recently unveiled the iPhone 16. And of course it was showing off Apple intelligence as the really big story this year. Well, Google did the same thing not too long ago with the Pixel 9 featuring, quote, the best of Google AI with its Gemini model. But their approaches are quite different. And I'm curious which one's gonna resonate more with consumers. So first things first, we've got Apple and Apple Intelligence. It's actually set to release October 2024 with iOS 18.1. It's gonna have a beta tag along with it. The iPhone 16 is shipping September 20th. So it's actually not gonna have the Apple Intelligence features right at launch, it'll come soon after. So what do you get with Apple Intelligence once it actually finally rolls out? Well, you get you know, standard writing tools, things like text rewriting, summarization, proofreading, and smart replies, which I would say, you know, this is pretty standard AI stuff. It's the stuff that we've come to expect. It's a kind of table stakes features at this point. As far as photos are concerned, yes, another one of those table stakes features, cleanup is what they call it. It's a tool for AI powered object removal inside of photos. You also get enhanced photo search and AI generated memories from groups of content within your library. So it can put together a little movie for you. In the mail app, I think this is actually really cool. You get email summaries and priority message highlighting. So certain important messages are kind of moved to the top of the inbox depending on the scenario, the date, that sort of thing. In the phone and notes app, you get audio recording and that includes transcription and summarization, something that AI is pretty good at these days. Now this one I think is really cool, although I really do admit that this is limited to a certain group of people, myself included, but the voice memo is getting some updates transcription, which is nice for everyone, of course, but multi-track audio recording and mixing, which I just think is really neat. I would love to have this. It makes me want an iPhone just to be able to play around with that. But I think one of the bigger things that's happening here with Apple intelligence is a revitalized Siri. So Siri for quite a long time has been in the shadow of other voice enabled AI systems. This is an opportunity for Apple to really reinvent what Siri is and what it's capable of doing. So you get new on-device language model that empowers it to do more things, improved conversational interactions. So you can do things like do a do-over if you need to, and it'll pick up on that. You also get visual cues inside of the interface, new visual cues that kind of sparkles around the edges when Siri is activated. But some of the more advanced features aren't coming until later this year or even sometime next year. Siri's getting some personal context capabilities, which is really gonna supercharge it. First and third party app support. So that widens the feature set potentially of what Siri can do. Visual intelligence, which I think is pretty neat, is on device visual context. So it really brings the camera into the AI system from an informational perspective. Genmoji, which is maybe more fun than anything else, but it's custom emoji creation. Image Playground, which is text to image generation. It's basically an app for generating imagery. And then Chat GPT integration, which is a pretty big partnership for Apple to bolster its writing tools. Now on the flip side is Google and it's Google Gemini, which actually comes pre-installed on the Pixel 9. And in this case, the Gemini app is replacing Google Assistant for many functions on the device. However, <laughs> Gemini actually lacks a decent amount of Assistant's current capabilities. Things that we've come to expect and use Assistant for, and in some cases rely on Assistant for, won't be available immediately with Gemini. What else does Gemini offer right now? Well, you've got the live chatbot conversations with Gemini Live, which actually Google just pushed out an update to allow free users to converse with Gemini Live. Image and screenshot parsing, so it can take a look at the images, it can take a look at the screenshots that you take and pull out information. Overlay functionality for most apps, and that's really a core key component of what Gemini does on device, which we'll talk about in a second. And yes, you get the writing tasks, things like email drafting, all of the, you know, the very LLM type uh, applications that you've come to expect from AI today. Now, some of the more advanced features 
do require a monthly subscription fee, $20 a month for Gemini Advanced, and you get enhanced capabilities within Gmail and Docs and other you know, parts of Google's properties so that that information can flow in between them. You get image generation with Imagine 3 and you know other features. But if you happen to have the Pixel, like I do, the Pixel 9, you're gonna get Pixel Studio for on-device image generation. You also get enhanced photos capabilities. Now, what I really want to shine a light on is the differing approach in strategies here. Apple's approach really centers on ecosystem integration. It's baking AI into the operating system layer. And we all know the old saw, it just works, right? Because Apple controls the hardware and Apple controls the software. This allows for optimization control with Apple's neural engine. It allows for more on-device processing. So yes, things might move faster or process faster. And you've got Apple's ongoing assurances of privacy and a commitment to privacy. This includes the private cloud compute, which is yes, cloud compute for AI, but they say no data retention at all. It's completely private in much the same way as it would be if it was on device. Now, Google, true to its open nature, really treats Gemini as an app layer on top of the OS. It's an app that you have to install, right? This approach offers wider compatibility across Android devices because there are an insane amount of Android devices all over the world. It provides more flexibility for users and manufacturers. In fact, like I said, you can uninstall it if you want. And all of this really means more users are in the pool if you compare it to Apple. But the really big question that I have about this, which of these two strategies is the one that will actually win users? We're at a moment right now where AI is really hot, or at least the tech companies want us to believe that AI is really hot. And they're coming up with all of these reasons why they think we as users might want to use the AI that they're producing. Apple's integrated approach might make more sense to users. It might just be easier to use because it's integrated at the OS level. Google's everything, everywhere, all the time strategy might actually confuse users. Yes, it's in all of these places, but it's kind of an extra layer that requires an app to feed into these different areas. But at the same time, Google's openness could just simply mean more users due to sheer volume of exposure. And AI, as we know, can be vast. It can be wide reaching in what it's capable of. With that comes the challenge of knowing at the end of the day that the features actually exist and when to actually use them. Apple's integrated approach really makes more sense to me from that perspective anyways. While Google's might actually be more capable, it's still kind of difficult to know where features can be found and when. So that's really the big question that I have. Which approach will actually get users to engage with these advanced AI features on their smartphones. There's Apple's seamless integration, or there's Google's flexible, but sometimes fragmented, there I said it, offering. What do you think? I'm really curious to hear what you have to say. Drop a comment below, love to hear about it, and I'll see you next time. Thanks everybody.